National Institute of Dramatic Art is in town at the moment, which it is at this time of every year, to show off its graduating class. After the first performance of Love's Labour's Lost, the NIDA crew was celebrating, and as director John Clark told me, it wasn't just for one reason. Apparently there's good news from the budget. Well, we got in the budget tonight uh, enough money to start a new building, a new building that has been planned for a number of years now, and tonight was the final OK, so we're all at night, I think, particularly happy. Wonderful. And what's this building for, John? Oh, well, up to now, over the last, what, 25 years, NIDA has been accommodated in the most appalling collection of buildings. I mean, it's been almost intolerable and getting more difficult each year to go on living in those circumstances. And this means now that we can have a proper building that's designed especially for a theatre school. And it means that the students who are going to be there in future years are going to be able to train now in buildings and using facilities that are roughly equivalent to the um, sort of buildings they're going to be working in when they get out of NIDA. Right. And do you know how much the ground is for? Uh, I, well, the whole lot is about four million, uh, but that won't, of course, all be used in the one year. So we've got round about half in the present uh, budget for the next financial year. Gathered at the Raymond Terrace Bowling Club today were business people from the Maitland area learning how to better protect their staff and their assets. Lectures were given by officers from the Crime Prevention Squad in Sydney, Newcastle CIB and the Maitland Police. Police at Maitland have issued a list of do's and don'ts in armed hold-ups. Although mostly common sense, the recommendations are often forgotten by panicking staff members. Most importantly, police stress that if faced with a weapon, like this commonly used sawn-off shotgun, staff should not be heroic and turn a hold-up into a murder. According to Inspector Mark Hickson, some firms have fragmented security systems and a major aim of police will be to standardise security arrangements. Meanwhile, another police function will be seen in Newcastle on Friday night when a blue light disco is held for the first time. To be conducted at the Police Boys Club in Broadmeadow, the dance is aimed at high school aged youths. I asked Sergeant Mike Stevens what the object of the disco is. Well, the discos are uh, marked to, uh, to give young people who are under, under the age of 18 years a place to go where they can feel uh, that they, uh, they have uh, good entertainment, they're well supervised uh, by off-duty uh, police officers, and uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, an excellent public relations exercise as far as the uh, New South Wales Police Department is concerned. are guaranteed for the next five years, it is little comfort to those who have already lost their jobs. The Hunter Development Board says that with no foreseeable increase in the heavy industrial workforce, such workers are virtually unemployable if retrenched. The scheme announced today by the Board is an experiment in helping these retrench and will train 20 people for 12 weeks starting in September. The group will attend the WEA in Newcastle five days a week and will be paid under the Federal Government allowance. The board says that if it is successful, larger programs could follow. Workers more used to a steel mill will be retrained in mathematics, language skills, writing and personal communication. According to Mal Davies of the Hunter Development Board, participants will be made familiar with workplaces much different to the BHP. Mal, is this course a recognition that Newcastle people must train for white collar jobs? No, I don't think it's really that, ne not necessarily white-collar jobs. I think it's certainly a recognition that uh, in the manufacturing sector, for example, uh, we've been losing, losing jobs over the years. There's been a contraction in that sector. I think we're seeing jobs disappearing now that will never return. And certainly, um, it is a recognition that people have to look elsewhere for jobs. Not necessarily white-collar jobs, but other jobs. Blaze that began at about 10 o'clock last night. 
The house, which is used as a storage area by the adjacent Working Women's Centre, was badly burnt inside. The house contained nappies, toys and scrolls. No one was in the house at the time of the fire. Simon believed the blaze was started by an electrical fault. Day. The single-engine Cessna was flying over the Belford State Forest when, according to the pilot, there was a bang and he lost all power. The four parachutists jumped from the plane before 24-year-old Jeff Stillman of Cessna brought it down safely in the Black Creek paddock. 14-year-old Gavin Slattery witnessed the incident. I saw a shadow on the ground I looked up and, you know, it was an aeroplane and um, I knew something was wrong because there was pieces flapping all over the place and there was... You know, the engine had stopped completely and it circled around and, the, you know, I could see some parachuters over, over the bush and they, you know, jumped out and the plane circled around and came down in the paddock. It was very quick and the engine just fell out of it completely and stopped it. The pilot and the parachutists were understandably shaken by the ordeal. Their what first thoughts after the police today. reports Either were complete up. were for drinks well, at the nearest basically, pub. Uh, the parachutists, well, then, three from uh, Sydney and uh, one from Wollongong, this is, uh, were in the area for a competition organised by the Newcastle Parachute Club. Uh, Although they had to make know, quickly when the pilot instructed them to uh, jump, get out, all yeah, managed we, to land we were without right. injury. Everybody was open, According no to 27-year-old uh, Grant Hassel of Campbelltown, it is thanks to the pilot that the incident did not turn into a disaster. The pilot did an exceptional job. Uh, it was just totally unexpected, no, no warning whatsoever, and bang, stop, and next thing I know, pilots instructed me that uh, get out, you know, help me is opening the door, and uh, we went. want to do is to direct parents' attention to be more careful, to ensure that if their children are going out on cycles on the road, that they wear bright clothing, that they wear helmets. That we want to ask the parents, don't let your children use the roads as playgrounds. And if you are travelling in the school holidays, make sure that your children in the car wear their seat belts or wear their seat restraints. And that way, we can do more than anything else to reduce the death rate and injury rate of our children. Is the government doing anything to improve safety on the roads? We have two major initiatives in the budget. One is a 45% increase in federal expenditure on roads, and that's just simply to make our roads safer, easier to drive upon. And the other is a 56% increase in the amount of money we're directing to road safety, and a major research program about how we get the message across better to parents and to road users on road safety. But how much can the government do, and how much comes back to the drivers themselves? We can show, we can indicate, we can try to educate. But fundamentally, it comes back to the parents and their own interests, in their children when on the road, and in their own interest of how they handle and adhere to the road rules, how they handle their own vehicle. Here in Newcastle, three Westpac Bank branches are expected to close before October next year. The first one, this one at Swansea, will close next month. Since the Wales Bank merger with the Commercial Bank of Australia in October last year, there have been two Westpac Bank branches in Swansea. This one will close on September the 24th, with the staff of five being transferred 100 yards up the road to the newer building. Here in Belmont, the merger meant a Westpac Bank on opposite corners of the Pacific Highway, and it's likely one of these branches will close in the near future. Branches in Nelson Bay and Charlestown will also be reviewed in the next 12 months. But the regional manager, Mr Bob Dalgleish, says the rationalisation of branch offices will mean better bank services and make the assurance that no jobs will be lost in the Hunter through the move.
host for this year's event and racing lovers from all over the Central Coast and the Hunter Valley attended the dinner. It was a chance to pay tribute not only to the horses, who incidentally ate in their stables last night, but also to the trainers and owners. As the chairman of the Newcastle Hunter and Central Coast Racing Association, Mr Bill Rutledge explains. It's a, a recognition night for a, a very large industry in our whole area. And that's why we run it, not only to recognise the best horses and the best owners and trainers, but uh, as a recognition for everybody involved in the industry. How are the best horses selected? Well, we have a, a very expert panel, including a, a number of your media colleagues and uh, Sam North, uh, and they look into the, all their uh, performances over the year and uh, they sum it all up and at the end of the year they decide who are the leading, uh, uh, leading horses. And, uh, we feel it's a prestigious award, it's grown in stature and uh, we're very proud of it. most affected by the establishment of an international hotel is Mr Bill Gregson, General Manager of the Park Royal Hotel. He says he doesn't believe the venture is a viable economic proposition. He says the four major hotels are having trouble filling their beds now. He also believes Newcastle cannot support an expensive hotel such as the one being proposed. Bill Baker from the Hunter Tourist Association disagrees. He is welcoming the $27 million hotel, hotel with open arms. He says the projects currently in the pipeline or underway in Newcastle will change the city's needs. And that, according to Bill, is where the Frederick Ash Building Hotel project comes in. It's a very positive step for the city and I think it's the first of a number of very good initiatives that are going to be taking place in the city on behalf of a number of investors. Uh, for quite some time the city has needed, and the whole Hunter region has needed some sort of investment like this, but uh, in the area of attractions as well, I think that uh, in the future we'll see some very good things coming forward. saw it as their last chance to cut the National League players KB United down to size. Despite support from the crowd, Adamstown did not achieve its aim. The final score was 4-1, with David Lowe scoring a hat-trick of three goals and Captain Craig Mason scoring the fourth. Carl Lachlan scored Adamstown's only goal in the 30th minute of the second half. The $1,000 prize money will go toward KB United's Tour of America, planned for later this year. The old timber poles of cars is taken shortly after they come from almost a year to install underground power supply off the main street from Hamilton to Broadway Nineways. Most of the work is being completed, except this section of work from Parry Street to Lawson Street, Hamilton, which was carried out today. The huge cable made a snake-like journey underground. And as the power below was installed, workmen were preparing to remove the timber poles and without any interruption to power supplies. Reaching the final stages of this massive project enticed the chairman of the Shortland County Council, Paul Van Henderson, to today. He was just as intrigued to see the men in the school and the neighbours prepare them for work. Other such work was going on at Raymond Terrace, and hopefully the timber poles will soon be a thing of the past in city and suburban streets. Premier has promised that through capital works the government will stimulate employment in the Maitland area. 
He made it clear, however, that the future of the Bradmill textile plant at Rutherford lies in the lap of private enterprise. During a media conference at the Town Hall, the Premier said that Maitland was central to the well-being of the Hunter Valley. He said that Alcan's third pot line at Curry had already given the region a shot in the arm and expressed hope for a resurgence of interest in the Lochinvar aluminium smelter. The Premier went on to discuss the budget projects planned for the Maitland area. According to Mr Rann, $4 million is to be spent on community and pensioner housing, tenders will be called for the construction of both a high school and a primary school at Rutherford, and for the long-awaited Maitland Technical College at Metford. He added that there was still a great deal of confusion surrounding funding for the Maitland bypass, but that tenders would be called in January for work on the eastern end, whether or not the matter had been sorted out. The Premier did not say when work on any of those projects would commence and when questioned on the government's plans for the Rutherford textile mill, this was all Mr Rann had to offer. It's very difficult for us to keep a company operating when it says it's going to cease operating. I've had discussions uh, with the unions and I've asked them to come back with any proposals or alternatives uh, they think uh, may keep some of the people in work. Uh, the company of course owes our government. Uh, a couple of million dollars uh, because uh, we lent that to them some time ago in order to encourage them to keep the plant uh, going. So there may be something we can do uh, with that couple of million dollars uh, which could uh, generate uh, some uh, employment in the region. Uh, the government wouldn't consider purchasing the plant? Well the government really couldn't run a textile plant and I think it would be quite fanciful for me even to give the impression that that was one of the options available to us. No, I think the best way we can go about things is to endeavour to, to encourage another company with the expertise and with the capacity to develop markets to sell the products to take over the Bradmill site. After the conference, Mr Rand joined water board officials on a tour of the Walker Waterworks site on Maitland's outskirts. The purpose of the inspection was to allow the Premier to assess the suitability of the site for tourist development. Mr Rand says he would be keen to see such development go ahead and also expressed interest in developing the South Maitland Railways as a tourist attraction. the upgrading of Burwood Beach Sewage Plant is one of the Hunter District Water Board's top priorities. He sees next month's seminar as an opportunity for the public to air its views. A variety of options beside the uh, long deep ocean outfall that we've been thinking about for the last 15 years and uh, certainly we would hope to canvas those. Um, but uh, there are a lot of people in the community that want to have their say about dirty beaches and so on anyhow so I expect we'll hear from them as well. Established in 1980-81, it's almost four and a half million shore, and then reuse it in the city's industries and coal loading facilities. But for this, the board says it needs more time for planning. Dr. Brian Williams from the Board of Environmental Studies believes many people are confused about the mechanics behind the water board's options. The main purpose is to inform people, to let people know what the uh, Hunter District Water Board is proposing down at uh, the Burwood Beach outfall and um, just what effects that's likely to have in the future, what it will cost, how it will be paid for and, and matters of that sort.
20-year-old Scott Harrison plays for the Katara South Juniors and was selected to represent Newcastle in the state titles held at Gosford. From there he was picked in the Northern New South Wales team to compete in the national titles at DY in Sydney. Okay, next time, if that wasn't enough, Scott was then chosen to represent Australia in the international fixture last Sunday. Matthew Nicholson's season has been a direct parallel to that of Scott's. The Cardiff Junior has gone one step further in being asked to join the train on squad of 36, hoping to be picked to go to New Zealand in December for the Oceania series. Scott was ineligible because of his age. Central Coast teenager Derek Kaisley also played for the Australian under-15 side against the Kiwis.